Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Deegan. On the show today, as Talk TV moves online and GB News reveals dire finances, we look back at the health of the startup news channels. Uh, also on the program, Global looks to STV's boss to lead the company. Uh, what challenges are ahead for the UK's biggest commercial radio group? All that plus whether journalists are too narrow-sighted when reporting the news. And in the Media Quiz, we play Radio Battleships. That's all to come in this edition of the Media Podcast. In the news this week, the European Union has fined Apple 2 billion euro for banning music streamers like Spotify from informing iOS users about cheaper music services available outside the app. Spotify said the fine sends a powerful message whilst Apple will appeal the ruling. Uh, Britain's largest newspaper group, Reach, released its results for last year on Tuesday. Digital revenues had the biggest fall after fewer referrals from Facebook and Google searches. But the publisher has reduced its funds for future claims as a result of phone hacking trials after Prince Harry's trial judgment. And Doctors, the long-running drama has had its final day of filming. That was last Friday. A screenwriter, Philip Ralph, said that the series had given opportunity and experience to writers like himself, as well as actors and crew. And the decision to close the show was disastrous. Of course, we at the Media Podcast have been going in some form since 2005, when Doctors was still finding its feet. Uh, joining me, Chris Lockery, editor of Pop Bitch. What were you doing in 2005? Oh, God. Taking my first steps into the the adult working world, I think. Uh, Like many of the people on on Doctors, really. Um, uh, And uh, Jake Cantor, Investigations Editor at Deadline. What were you doing? 2005. I was in the second year of university, oh, okay. living my best life. You were just, you were just a, a media, not, haven't emerged yet as a media entity. I mean, you're nearly 20 years old. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a magnificent achievement. It is in lots of different forms, like Doctor yeah. Who, the show yeah. is evolved. Regenerating. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. And who knows what that might happen next? Uh, certainly not me. Um, so what have you both been up to this week? Um, uh, Jake? Uh, well, we've, we've just been discussing mm. off air. I've been kept busy by uh, a story that I've been working on for a little while. It's about uh, agents in the TV and film world uh, misleading their clients and sending them fake audition invites. Um, it's quite an industry story, but it means a lot to uh, the 98%. And when I say the 98%, I mean actors who uh, make up the majority of the profession but are not stars, mm. not Hollywood stars. And uh, they are being misled by their agents. And uh, people feel very, very strongly about it. And uh, people are very upset. And since putting it out, have you had lots of follow-ups from other people about similar things? Yes. I think inevitably when you touch on a, a sort of a nerve like this, uh, people tend to reflect on their own auditions, mm. go and do some digging themselves, and uh, sometimes get in touch with me and say, hey, I've had, I've had some fake tapes as well. Uh, the fake tape story. Uh, and Chris, um, what's been keeping your inbox on fire this, this week? Uh, mostly, uh, thanks to Jerry Halliwell, um, <laughs> the F1 uh, Red Bull Christian Horner story. Mm. Um, so doesn't seem to stop. There seems to be doesn't seem to stop, and the, the yeah, there's sort of strange errors. It's constantly evolving. So I, last uh, week, shortly after you'll have recorded, um, a, a a cache of anonymous texts uh, were, were emailed out to um, F1 journalists and, and others, seem to give evidence in this case that's been brought against Christian Horner for inappropriate workplace conduct. He was cleared from a, a, an independent investigation last week. Within 24 hours, then, this evidence made its way into the inboxes of journalists uh, and, and F1 bosses. And uh, the story's kind of snowballed from there. What's been interesting is is that anyone with any interest in the story has probably come across the link and read the alleged messages. Mm. And yet the, the the journalists covering it are in a, in a difficult position because there is absolutely no guarantee that these um, messages are what they say they are. Mm. could be a very sophisticated hoax. Uh, there's just no telling. And w- w- what's interesting about that from a, from a sort of like media law perspective is depending on who's leaked those texts uh, really changes the... The, the legality of it all, really, I suppose. Really it? changes if the it, legality of it if all, it's yeah. it's been grabbed or a um, participants got involved, I suppose. But, um, yeah, and it's to, and to do with his privacy being invaded. If it's if, if the, the leaks have come from the accuser, then uh, their right to... Their Article 10 right to freedom of expression probably would outweigh Christian Horner's Article 8 right to privacy. Uh, if it was anybody else, then his right to privacy probably trumps 
their rights to freedom of expression. So once again, we're in this it's an interesting not, not issue for a sort of salacious story, but that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, there's also just like oh, Jerry Halliwell <laughs> had to walk out on her heels, and uh, uh, you know, um, out in Bahrain. So there's all that kind of salacious side to it too, and some of the messages are. Uh, fairly they're on the verge of being mucky so there's mm. a kind of yeah there's a there's a there's a, a salacious element to it too always a bit of interest in that too oh it's it's a, it's a media adjacent story which is brilliant <laughs> for me because i get to read and devour it and not have to write about it <laughs> yeah. which is brilliant. Yeah. and it, of course it's all made more uh pronounced by the netflix show mm. uh, oh, of course, and, yeah. and you know that that's created a soap opera around f1 and this is like the perfect storyline for that it is. soap opera it is interesting whether they cover it how they cover it uh, okay after a few weeks of speculation talk tv is to stop broadcasting and move solely online it was announced this week uh, jake this follows pierce morgan's announcement a few weeks ago uh, that he was sort of off to youtube he sort of tried to get out before i guess this this big news <laughs> dropped um what does it mean Oh, well, I wonder how much warning Piers had and whether mm. he was able to, uh, allowed to save a bit of face. Um, look, I think uh, since his announcement a couple of weeks ago that he was moving to YouTube, I think the writing has been on the wall for Talk TV. It was just a matter of when, not if. I think it shows that, uh, that this is a rare Murdoch misfire. There is a feeling at News UK that... Um, uh, that they should have stuck to their guns and uh, gone with the original plan, which was to launch online and for it to be a streaming service. They kind of reacted to GB News and have lost the battle of the sort of right wing yes. news stations. What a uh, terrible war to be in and then to lose yeah. on top of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, look, it, I, you know, I, I think even though the news was expected, I think it was a difficult uh, all staff meeting. I think I've been told there's, there were some tears, um, but insiders are equally not surprised. I mean, you know, the, the, the resource has been sort of leached out of the station for a little while. And the idea of it becoming a YouTube only station is a bit of a fig leaf, for, mm. uh, uh, you know, a, a slow wind down. I mean, Chris, when I was looking at the uh, statement that the uh, Scott Taunton, the head of broadcasting, mm. said, there's some of it that I sort of buy into, which is um, it hasn't really worked um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but actually what they've been left with is quite interesting infrastructure, the ability to actually accelerate what they can do at the Sun or the Times or their other radio stations. Yeah. I mean, this is sort of publisher's dilemma, isn't it? How far you go into digital away from your, your regular business. And people kind of blow hot and cold with that don't Mm -hmm. they yeah i mean i I read that email and uh, first pass i thought um oh you know there's a lot of this makes a lot of sense you know very very rational sort of business decision here but then when i was thinking about it they were that i'd sort of forgotten that it's only really started less than two years ago Mm. and they're talking as if the change in uh, viewer habits listener habits has suddenly crept up on them in the last 18 months but people have been you know, digesting news through their phones for the best part of a decade now. Mm. And it then suddenly on second read, I thought, yeah, this is very face saving. Really, they basically, yes, as you say, may, misfired and they, they should have really launched online. The idea of doing this uh, linear, having a linear, they said they they didn't feel brave enough, was the phrase, not to not to launch without a linear uh, uh, presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So broadcast um, TV, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's obviously been an expensive mistake of theirs to to sort of hang on to that heritage um presentation yeah. you know um, i mean they've invested very heavily in the, the studio space there and I, it looks know, good. I've, I've, I've been there yeah. it's it's a really impressive operation mm. and if they can repurpose that and service other brands like the sun uh, and increase the video content around times radio then it won't have been a um a disastrous mm. venture uh, obviously, what they were fighting against was GB News, and at some point talks about mergers or takeovers. Um, but sort of within minutes of uh, their announcement, uh, news about GB News continuing to be a sort of financial basket case, if you look at it in the traditional sense. Uh, they talked about it uh, being able to break even in year three. Um, how's that looking? Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> but does it matter? I don't think it does. No. I think I think it's a very expensive hobby mm. for Paul Marshall, and um, you know he is clearly of a mind to uh, gain some influence in the media agenda. You know, there's lots of speculation about him wanting to uh, buy the Telegraph and the Spectator, but in GB News, he has managed to cultivate uh, a brand that, although it's incredibly chaotic in its launch, is now a genuine. 
um, a, a genuine force within within the within the news space. It reaches uh, about two point seven million people, I think, over a month. It, it's, it's more than that now. It's it's, it's okay. consistently getting over three million reach a month. Um, Online views are up, yeah. but that but again, also it, it, as an agitator in the space as well. Mm-hmm. It's you know that's where a lot of its real value lies because you know whether people watch it or don't, um, it makes headlines in and of itself. Certainly, you know the. The, the the caliber of politician they're luring away yes. from the commons to to host on that show you know completely undermines their their positioning as like the underdog channel but you know i mean they they're, are, they've become the establishment yeah i, I mean yes i mean quite literally mm. it, they, but um uh, yeah it, it, the the power that that presents whether you're getting eyeballs on it or not there is a, a great deal of of heft there and for the amounts they're putting in, what is forty one million, I mm. think they just the the parent company put in last year. You know, there's there's a case to be made for that being a fairly decent investment. I mean, probably not at the minute because the way the election's going. But also they're gonna be in a great position post election yeah. if, if the polls are to be believed and the Conservatives don't do so well. The sort of G B news flavour of the Conservative Party becomes incredibly strong and they become the leader in that. I mean it's sort of a Sir Paul Marshall um uh, equivalent of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I feel, because <laughs> you've got you've got GB News, uh, you've got Unheard, which sometimes people forget that uh, he mm-hmm. owns, um, and Telegraph is still a little bit up in the air. It seems to be with Redbird, but it, it might they might have to do something with it. I mean, that's what he's after to be a sort of right wing kingmaker. Yes, um, I mean that's uh, you. Know, I think that's probably partly the aim. I, I don't know. He's a he's a bit of a mysterious figure. We don't know much about him. Uh, and um, you know, I saw the news agents uh, a couple of weeks ago managed to mm. uh, get hold or get access to his Twitter account in which he was liking and um, retweeting some you know fairly extreme views. It's clear that uh, there is a bigger game than financial one, and and there has to be because. Uh, GB News's revenues were what about six million pounds, which is you know paltry really, and I don't see a way in which that's going to increase significantly. I was watching it on Budget Day, and you know prime time for a channel like GB News, the advertising was was there, but they're not they still don't have blue chip advertisers, mm. and I don't see that changing significantly in in the in the coming years. So the Ofcom chair, um, she said something which Ofcom kind of don't normally, you don't hear it said out loud about um, about them not having to pay much as much attention to GB News as they would, say, a traditional broadcaster. Uh, why is that? So, uh, yeah, I, when I first read the remarks, they I raised my eyebrows, mm. just like you. Um, but actually, it is backed up by the code. And... Um, content has to be justified by its context and I think if you've got more viewers that means more responsibility and that means that greater scrutiny will potentially be applied to the likes of the BBC, Channel 4, ITV uh, as opposed to uh, or, uh, you know, as opposed to GB News in this example which has a much smaller audience. I mean Chris it feels like we've got sort of these odd partial news channels sort of by the mm. back door. It says news on the top but really is a current affairs so they're, they're regulated in a different way. Um, this genie isn't going back in the bottle anytime soon is it? No and it, it, it seems that we're, it's, it's going a bit fractal as well so this week as um, Dan Wooten announced that he was going to be starting his own independent mm. Uh, uh, media concern. Uh, this is after he officially left GB News um, this week. That's to combat, uh, that what, came, to combat what he called the off-communists. The off-communists, exactly. <laughs> Much more of that absolutely <laughs> red-hot wordplay coming your way soon on Dan. Uh, Dan Watton Outspoken, I believe, is the one he's gone for. Um, and But I saw today as well, I, I think Lawrence Fox and Calvin Robinson are launching their own uh, thing talk about the Marvel yes. universe. They released a trailer for it. It looked like it looked like something Guy Ritchie <laughs> would have done at university. It was it was two of them sort of smoking cigars, blowing lots of lens flare and stuff. The two of them, Calvin Robinson, given the sort of sign of the cross, outspoken Fox and Father or Father and Fox, it's called. Oh, and they're going to do so. It seems like all the people that have um, left GB News for one reason or another are looking to, to set up their own kind of challenges to that orthodoxy. So I mean, you're much better, much better chance of making some money as sort of individuals doing something than you are yeah. by being a large organisation. And you see in America where there's obviously a lot of support for this kind of content and media. I always feel that the assumption from that 
sort of group of people in the right wing is that there are more people who are interested in it than there actually are. Yeah, I mean, I guess they'll get a when it's their own uh, finances on the line, they'll yes. get a they'll get a, a rude awakening, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I think. Well, I think Wotton had a slight taste of it himself when he tried to crowdfund his legal response and didn't get quite the uh, response he was hoping for. I mean, the Met have cleared him, mm -hmm. but it's one element of a much wider story. Yeah, there? there's no... There's, the the police have decided, or two police forces have decided, there is no evidence of criminal wrongdoing. Mm. That doesn't sort of uh, alleviate any of the issues that were there to do with uh, workplace harassment, mm. uh, bullying... Um, interpersonal relationships in the workplace a lot of alleged behavior re regarding that sort of still stands mm. he may not face court as a result of it or any any sentence but that that doesn't exonerate him completely and there's an interesting uh legal i'm going to call it a legal tactic being deployed we've seen it used in in other places where you send some letters out so the the down one has um sent letters to the guardian and the guardian have withdrawn an article and offered to pay uh towards his legal costs as a result. This is to do with naming him a head uh, as part of an active police investigation, which uh, I think certain commentators and uh, institutions maybe did get a little carried away in thinking what they could publish about this in the, in the, uh, the heat of the moment when there was some momentum behind mm. the, the story. And The Guardian have relented and said, yes, they were wrong to do that. They, they, they're using a very recent uh, legal case Bloomberg one that uh, 2002 I think it was to say that you know pe people are entitled to a degree of privacy regarding ongoing police investigations and that he should never have been named ahead of the decision that they took that has been sort of cynically used I would argue to sort of give him total vindication total exoneration from everything he's been accused of so using that to say you see this was all just a big witch hunt. Yes. this was all nonsense it was politically motivated smear um and also while it's true that that you know the Guardian feel that they've uh, misstepped in in naming him ahead of time, uh, you know that's all that proves mm. really, nothing more. Uh, moving on, uh, Global, uh, the media company, are going to have a new CEO next year. And Jake, it's Simon Pitts, who's currently the boss of STV. Um, yes. What do we know about him? Uh, well, Simon has been at STV for about six years. You know, STV is a is a very you know, pretty healthy broadcaster. Um, he's steered it through the pandemic. Um, I think the thing that he has done, which is really impressive, is he has grown STV Studios, which is the production arm, into a you know a genuinely uh, uh, you know respectable force in the production industry. You know, it makes shows uh, for Apple, including Criminal Record, which has got Peter Capaldi in. Um, you know, it used to trade off shows like Antiques Road Trip. Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with Antiques Road Trip. And but Taggart. It's, it's painting no, and, on, yeah, Taggart. And, and Taggart, yeah, it's painting on a slightly bigger scale these days and uh, and is, a, you, know, is a, you know, is a bit more in international in its focus. And I think we were a bit surprised to see Simon going. We, we thought he might go to ITV. Mm. Um, he's gone to Global. Uh, he's a you know he's a very imposing figure, and when I say that, I mean he's literally really <laughs> tall. <laughs> uh, he's very affable. He's a smart guy, uh, and I think Global is a great move for him. I think the question with Global is how much autonomy does he have? Maybe this is a better what question you for you. What do you mean? Sure, I mean surely Ashley pulls the strings yes. there, right? I mean that so, might, I, it might it might turn the spotlight on you, Matt. Yeah, so you got you got the owner of that business, yeah. um, and he's sort of really. The total owner, Ashley Tabor King, who's who's helped establish it. Um, I mean, interestingly, you know, Simon's predecessor, very strong personality too, and working with Ashley, uh, they've had a very successful relationship. As I understand it, there's not lots of discussion from other people about what that organisation should do. It's pretty much driven from the top, and I guess Simon has to work out whether he's going to be a collaborator with Ashley on defining that or whether he's more about instigating the boss's desires which you know if you own it you get to decide don't you yes I don't know I, I don't know I mean look Simon is clearly uh you know he's 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 part of the high profile media executives in the UK now my instinct is that he won't have gone there to just be a yes man to Ashley mm. I, I, I suspect if he's you know got grander designs on bigger jobs in the industry, he will want to make his mark there in his own way. 
Uh, absolutely. We'll be back with more media news after this. So, retrospectors, what historical events are we ticking off on this week's run of Today in History? Well, Monday is the anniversary of the day John Lennon said the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Then on Tuesday, we explain how Che Guevara became a literal poster boy. On Wednesday, the day the courts killed Napster. Thursday was the day the Romans did a Sabbath switcheroo. And on Friday, we recall the forgotten final TV appearance of the Marx Brothers. We discuss this and more on Today in History with the Retrospectors. Ten minutes every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, welcome back. Chris and Jake are still here with me. Uh, Chris, we were talking a bit there about sort of Dan Wooten and Substacks. I mean, oddly, Popbitch is sort of the original email newsletter, the kind of original email media newsletter. It's one of the, yeah, it's longest standing at least. It's um, 24 years, yeah. And looks just, very uh, similar to it did at yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah, still looks like um, <laughs> old typewriter ticker tape stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we've. It's uh, it's been a strange journey because um, you go through phases where where people tell you that newsletters are in again, and then they disappear. Everybody pivots to video. Mm. Then everybody stops pivoting to video and says newsletters are back in. <laughs> uh, then everybody tries to start linear TV again, and then it's back to newsletters. I think. What 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 is it about the newsletter that that has survived this long? I think what's interesting about the newsletter and what's useful about it is that it's. It's still a very personal connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if it is written and sent out to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, you still feel like you're you're receiving it yourself. It's come to you personally. So I think that's people develop quite a, a, a strong relationship with that. The costs to getting started are very minimal. It's mm-hmm. just you need an email address, really. I mean, there are um, systems if you want to make, make it pro. Yes. There's, a, there's a few going on. So you can professionalize that. But really, the the... The, the barrier to entry is is fairly small. So that means that uh, people, journalists, writers, even non-journalist writers who, who want to start building something, start writing something, can. And they can find an audience and they can grow that audience. You just circumvent the, the usual kind of gatekeepers of that. Uh, Obviously, quite a lot of the people who are kind of going to the more Substack world are looking at that ability to charge people and that kind of yep. mixture of free and fee. Mm-hmm. Um, on the pop pitch side, it's been always very much on the free end yeah yeah yeah. Um, and you must have thought about do we add subscription features over the years yeah we do we have a sort of um a a, a little premium tier where we do stuff like that people that 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 support us send us a a, a nominal fee four pounds a month Mm. if anyone's interested in signing up for club office but um you know and they will get an extra newsletter and a few other bonuses and stuff like that you know that's a really it's a it's an easy way for people who really want to support your work which there are a lot of people mm. want to do that sort of thing and and would be glad of the opportunity to do it if that functionality is there i think that has become more and more prevalent in recent years and that means that people say on substack or um oh, tiny letters just gone mm. but there's a beehive mm. the number of these services that have opened that, that allow that and allow people to monetize it and i don't think um audience begrudged paying it because it's not ad supported you know so many of the um the news websites are so flooded with advertising. It's very difficult to read what you want to read. You're forever kind of changing your GDPR settings, mm-hmm. you're clicking endless things to, to, to get rid of cookies. You don't really get any of that with newsletters. And, and what, what, that's good as well then for advertisers because um, you know people install ad blockers on their web browsers, which means that they don't see a lot of the stuff that is the lifeblood of a lot of these publications. They, you know, that's their, their main source of income. And it gets denied them, but you can't really do that with a with a direct to inbox newsletter. So it it does solve a lot of the problems that journalism is facing. It's just the scale of it, really, and the fact that it does compartmentalize everything into lots of small uh, niche products. Which means, you, on one hand, on one hand, you get to compile your own newspaper in that sense. So the old method was that you would buy the newspaper, you'd find the sections you like, you'd bin the rest, you'd read entertainment, you'd read mm. sports you'd throw anything hard in the bin. Um, and you can do that with newsletters, but they can come from all over the place. I guess the trouble is, is that people need to then find a way to make that work for them financially. And the scale thing's interesting, isn't it? Because it's something that sort of supports the smaller business in scope. I don't imagine there's hundreds of you at Pop Pitch headquarters no, no, no. putting it out each week. No, absolutely um, not. No, there's, there's, yeah, me and one other person, yeah. <laughs> but I imagine over the years there's been a view of like... Sh- should we 
pivot to video or should we build out the web, a web property or should we trade on that name to grow it yeah yeah they, and we we have done various projects i remember when ipad publishing was going to be the big savior of of journalism we had a digital you know pad padlet uh <laughs> offering which is good it allowed us to write longer things and, mm. and we ended up folding that into some of the newsletter stuff um gave us the chance to sort of spread our wings and try that a bit people don't really use um the app store to get their news in in the way that you know people predicted they did there's an interesting so, bit um, about like relationships with with publications mm-hmm. like yours i was talking to someone who'd set up a um a kind of patreon for their yeah, yeah. for their project and uh, they were quite obsessed with what all the levels would be. And they yeah. made some like merch for one of the levels and then launched it. A load of people went for that level. Uh, no one wanted to, was bothered sending the address in to get the merch yeah. because actually what they, were, what they were doing was supporting the creator yeah. rather than worrying about getting the pencil. If anyone decides to go into that kind of Patreon, we, I remember doing this with the Kickstarter once as mm. well, spending so much time. That was absolutely the biggest time drain of the whole project was figuring out the rewards and what to make and not to make too many of them so that you're stuck with box after <laughs> box of um, T-shirts that you can't shift or anything like that. And, you know, it, it actually probably took away from time that was probably better spent on figuring out what the product was, actually writing that. Um, so that's a trap people fall into. And I think, yeah, audiences are you know are fairly forgiving or at least they don't need a huge amount they do if you have that relationship with your readers then they like to be able to support it they like to feel that they're keeping you independent or you know making sure that they have a, a stake in in what they're reading something- which is really cool that's a, that's a, it's something that you know shouldn't be taken for granted but is an incredibly interesting part of the modern media landscape and it also sort of media bifurcates slightly doesn't it because on one hand you've got say the new york times who want to sort of be everything Mm -hmm. from cooking to product reviews to news and do a very good job of that and at the other end you've got people like yourself who are sort of picking one uh smaller area to sort of super serve yeah if you're sort of trapped in the middle are they the journals or, or publishers that are going to find it more difficult? And we, you know, think about something like Reach and Reach have had a lot of trouble recently yeah. trying to be a bit of something for everyone in yeah. the middle. I guess we'll find out fairly soon because they are they are struggling. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned the New York Times, and a, a lot of people describe it as a as a puzzle book that has a, you mm. know a huge news wing. <laughs> you know, lots of people play Wordle and probably do without realizing it's part of this larger media. Um, you know, they're cooking stuff uh is is hugely popular people will just go for that were they to try and build that without having the new york times behind it it would be very hard to organically create something like that not impossible people have done it but um more of a challenge much more of a challenge and you, do, you also don't want to spread your own product too thinly otherwise you only end up with people yeah there for the puzzles which when you used to sell papers as a big bundle that's fine you've got everybody in and you've got them buying the entire paper if you break that up too much and offer you know puzzle subscriptions and that ends up being your your bread and butter it's not as expensive as the what as what it costs to send people out and have bureaus all around the world getting you news you know maybe we'll just see puzzle bureaus around the world for the myt uh okay time for some news in brief Uh, gary young versus privileged journos Hmm. Uh, this is former guardian journalist gary young Uh, he delivered an inaugural rosemary hollis memorial lecture this week in it he highlighted how limited the lived experiences are of his fellow journalists and how that's led to a limited understanding of the problems people face. Chris, good analysis. Uh, I really enjoyed that speech. I thought it was very interesting, very uh, well put, very quotable. Um, And I think there's a lot to it. Yeah, but uh, there's um, a problem that that, uh, journalism has just as, as an industry, generally as a concept, I suppose, that you've got people trying to report dispassionately about what they see, but always people's experience, people's biases, what people think can, is, is worthy of being a story, all influences it, And that, but it's always positioned as a completely, you know, dispassionate clinical look at the world as it is. You know, that's an, a great ideal and something that everyone should work towards. Ideally, you, you uh, mitigate that problem by getting lots of journalists with lots of different experiences so that uh, everybody can have a sort of say and you don't have huge blind spots on your staff. All very noble goals, but journalism is also in crisis at the moment uh, with no money, fewer and fewer resources being spread over further and further outputs, which just creates a sort of perfect storm where 
you don't end up with this. And where where journalism is sort of finding its way and being rewarded, it's for people being specialists in certain areas, or it's certainly one of them. And again, I should caveat all of this by saying this is certainly my experience and my reading of journalism and the, the people that I read and the people that I see. Um, and it may well not be the case uh, across the board, but it feels like people are being rewarded for being specialists in certain areas, which is great because then you do get authoritative um, content from them. But by all means, it, it's not the be all and end all of everything going on in that world. So I it just, yeah, it spirals out very quickly as soon as you start to think about it. And I think, yeah, Gary, Gary raises some really interesting points. I think uh, the thing that made me reflect on was um, the demise of uh, the likes of BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Vice. You know, these are outlets for young uh, journalists to make their mark, to learn their trade. And they are essentially disappearing from the UK landscape. And that is really, really sad. And um, it, I think it goes to Gary's point. I mean, uh, Shirin Carla wrote about this brilliantly in The Guardian uh, a couple of weeks ago. She used to work at Vice and she was saying, I'm about to give a lecture to, to young journalism students. And I don't even know if I can recommend the industry to them. I don't know whether I can do that in good faith because the industry might let them down. And um, you're right. I think there's this, there's, this, there's this sort of perfect storm of circumstances. And it makes me really, really sad about the future of our industry. And I really hope that um, young journalists can find other avenues um, to getting their work noticed. And, uh, you know, mainstream established newspapers or other media outlets can tap into talent in, in different ways. Because it's difficult, Chris, isn't it? Because you can, so a lot of places have had schemes or have tried to think about this and tackle this, some better than others. And then actually when redundancies come in, mm-hmm. that sort of goes out the window because anything you've, you've put in place, the people you've, you've helped put in place can suddenly disappear because someone else is looking at it all. Yeah. Uh, and that can be pretty devastating. This can have an even bigger effect on trying to create a diverse workforce. Again, it's, it's whether sort of like the legacy institutions are... are other people to change it whether they can trying to diversify your uh, your staff trying to create programs that uh, benefit new grassroots journalists from different walks of life these are all very good but perhaps the system can't be changed perhaps any work that's done from the top down that way won't create lasting change that can weather you know periods of economic turmoil or um, you know international events that need sort of serious somber legacy reporting um maybe they maybe they do maybe i you know it's such a hard thing to do that uh, yeah god it it, it makes my mind melt to think about what the what the alternatives might be there's been lots of very interesting things grow up from the ground of people you know working as independent journalists and, and and creating useful resonant work but so then sometimes without the the brand recognition of somewhere big, mm. I'm trying not to name names, but, yep. you know, does it reach enough people? Does is it is it is it a lot of effort for very little mm. dial movement? Uh, and, and these legacy institutions aren't going to try and fund the places that will take them over and subsume yes. them. So it's not in their interest to do that. That's perfectly reasonable and legitimate. I'm not suggesting they need to sort of dig their own graves mm. here. But also they've got to create their own future as well in, yeah. some, of, in some of that too. The, the danger is you're purely self-motivated. If you don't start to fix some of those problems, you won't resonate with your audiences uh, and grow your own businesses. But how does that happen? You know, so the Murdoch empire tried to buy into Vice mm-hmm. and, and do that and sort of create a kind of next generation of young journalists, find that, be part of that story. And it's not helped or worked and arguably made it much worse. And we've just got time for the media quiz. This week it's entitled Radio 4 Battleships. <laughs> okay. uh, so after Radio 3's announcements last week, Radio 4 has changed up its schedule. So I now invite you to play Battleships, <laughs> sort of. Okay, here we go. I'm going to name a day and a time, and you tell me oh, what God. occupies that slot on the new oh, look no. schedule. Uh, taking effect this spring. Buzz in with your names if you know the answer. So Jake, you will say. Jake. And Chris, you will say. Chris. Let's play Radio 4 Battleships. Uh, Mohit, if you're listening, this is available to license. Uh, <laughs> question number one. Wednesday at 4 p.m. Jake. Yeah. Oh, J- ah, I Jake. Say Chris. I think I said Jake as well there. <laughs> Jake, you just got there. I, that's got to be the media show, hasn't it? It is. Yeah. The, the, uh, the name we don't speak on Nemesis. this podcast. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and it's being bumped up to an hour as well, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. going to be hour long. It can be visualised. What a concept. <laughs> visualised media programme. Yes, well done, Radio 4. Uh, okay, question number two. 11 a.m. on Sundays. Chris. Chris. Is that Desert Island Discs? So it's not quite Desert Island Discs. No. Uh, do you want to buzz in? Oh, I don't know the points from uh, me. This is the yeah. Archers, Archers Omnibus. Omnibus. Oh, right, okay. Uh, probably the most controversial change. It's booted later uh, by Desert Island Discs. Yeah. A uh, good choice. I think, oh, they can do what they want. I'm just annoyed I haven't got the points. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. Move it, move it back so I get the points. That's what sure, I want. Surely, Jake, it's available on BBC Sounds to catch up on. Well, I mean, th- I mean, that's the great thing about the artists is built this whole new audience on, mm. on BBC Sounds and young people are going to it. And No, they're yeah, not. They are. They're bringing it. Oh, it's I coming. Spoke, it's, I spoke to young people who, are, <laughs> who have become Archer's super fans. It's oh, coming. It's, they're, they're putting it on Sounds at midnight. So there's obviously people waiting up yes, late. Yeah, like, yeah, they're, they're, coming in, drops, they're coming man, in from the pub. Is. They're coming in from the clubs <laughs> and they're getting the Archers on. It's happening. They wouldn't do it otherwise. I'd almost like to work to become the Radio 4 controller just to <laughs> screw around with the Archers just, just for fun. <laughs> Uh, and finally, question number three, uh, 8 p.m. on Tuesdays. We're getting to the weeds now. 8 p.m. on Tuesdays. I honestly don't know the answer. To this well, question. it's yeah. still File on 4, the ah, investigations yeah. programme, uh, though now it's extended to 42 minutes. And Jake, as your prize, you get to work with Talk TV on their YouTube ambition. <laughs> so come back with some uh, ideas next time. Uh, and how can people keep up with your writing, Chris? Uh, I write uh, Popbitch every Thursday so you can sign up at popbitch.com uh, and Jake deadline.com and I'm at Jake underscore Cantor on X <laughs> <It's lovely. laughs> great to see you both thank Thanks. you well that's it today from the media podcast uh, remember you can get 25% off your first booking at the London Podcast Studios where we film the show um, all you need to do is use the code MEDIAPOD just head to the London Podcast Studios.com for 25% off when you use the code MEDIAPOD uh, and of course if you're new to the show make sure you've hit follow in your podcast app of choice to get this every week uh, and you can see what we look like on the YouTube channel as well uh, my name is Matt Teagan the producer was Matt Hill it was a Rethink Audio production and I'll see you next week.